Chapter 30 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Smith. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Hare Uward Carrington. Chapter 30 Hypnotism and Mesmerism. The word mesmerism is derived from Anton Mesire, who founded the system and who performed all the early experiments in this field. It was known as mesmerism for about 50 years until an English physician by the name of Dr. James Braid coined a new word, hypnotism, from the Greek hypnos, sleep, and this is the word which has been used almost exclusively from that date to this. The difference between hypnotism and mesmerism. The majority of persons would claim at the present day that hypnotism and mesmerism are identical, there being no difference between them. They are both due, it is said, to suggestion and the influence of the mind over the body. Very similar phenomena occur in both cases. It is true, but I believe that there is a difference between the two processes and conditions. Mesmerism is based on the belief that there is a definite physical emanation or vital fluid which passes from the operator into the subject while the mesmeric passes are being made over the latter's body. Hypnotism, on the other hand, is due entirely to suggestion, the influence of the subconscious mind upon the body. There is no physical influence or effluence in hypnotic practice, and it is claimed that all the phenomena of mesmerism, apparently showing such influence, are in reality entirely due to suggestion. As before stated, however, we believe that there is a difference between the two processes and that hypnotism is due solely to physical causes, but that in mesmerism the human fluid before spoken of plays a part. As proof of this, I may cite, among other proofs, the fact that clairvoyance and many of the so-called higher phenomena are frequently obtained in mesmeric trance, while there are extremely rare in hypnotic trance other phenomena could be mentioned, but this will suffice for the present. Mesmerism, being due to the passage of a vital fluid from the body of the operator into the subject, contact and passes are essential. If, therefore, you wish to mesmerize your subject, you should make passes over his head, forehead, eyes, and down the front of the body. All downward passes are sleep passes, and all upward passes are walking passes. Placing the hands on certain nerve centers of the forehead, and particularly between the eyes and over the temples, will help to induce sleep. Also, clasping the patient's hands and placing the point of your thumb in contact with the point of his thumb establishes the current and serves to induce the mesmeric trance. In hypnotism, on the other hand, passes are not essential, though often help. In hypnotizing a subject, it is common to ask him, first of all, to gaze at a bright object until his eyes tire. When the lids are closed, suggestions of sleep are given, or the subject may open and close the eyes a number of times as you count and this will serve to induce the initial stages of hypnotic trance. The deeper stages are induced by means of suggestion. Post-hypnotic suggestion is a form of treatment often resorted to and is a good subject for experimentation. It means that the subject performs, after awaking from trance, certain actions suggested to him when entranced. He remembers nothing of the suggestions, but carries them out to the letter. Many hypnotic subjects have extraordinary ability in calculating time, 
and can guess to a second the length of time which has elapsed between certain intervals or carry out post hypnotically a suggestion given them in trance days or even weeks before hypnotism is a useful method of opening up and exploring the subconscious mind we are enabled to tap it as it were and get in touch with hidden portions of our being which we could otherwise never reach dreams may be analyzed in this manner also unpleasant thoughts impressions emotions etc removed and frequently undesirable influences banished by hypnotic suggestion hypnotism seems to reach a deeper stratum of our mind than ordinary waking suggestion and because of this fact it is at times so useful for instance the drink habit has often been cured by hypnotic suggestion hence we see that there must be more in the hypnotic command than mere advice or persuasion because of thousands of drunkards have been advised not to drink but they continue to do so nevertheless by means of hypnotism we are enabled to reach a portion of the mind so deep that it controls the whole being and the result is that these deep-rooted habits may at times be removed and eradicated this is one of the distinguishing marks of the hypnotic state that a more fundamental control over the body and mind is obtained and by reason of this fact many cures of diseased conditions and abnormal states of mind have been recorded which have been otherwise treated ineffectively there is a difference between the hypnotic and the mediumistic trance though not so great as that existing between the latter and the mesmeric state in both the mediumistic and the mesmeric trance a form of magnetism is doubtless employed and this connects them in a subtle bond of union it is because of this that telepathy clairvoyance etc are so often obtained in the mesmeric trance which is closely akin to the condition secured by mediums in which they obtain genuine mediumistic messages the fear of being hypnotized many persons are afraid of being hypnotized this fear being based partly upon valid reasons and partly upon superstition properly induced by an expert the hypnotic trance is not injurious on the contrary it is often extremely beneficial and as before pointed out quickens the mental and physical powers removes bad habits effects cures etc on the other hand when hypnotism is applied by an ignorant or bungling operator who does not know his business the result may be very detrimental to the health of the person hypnotized a state may be induced which neither the operator nor anybody else fully understands for no one at the present time fully comprehends the nature of the condition thereby induced the conscious mind is removed from its supremacy and that this is often a fatal mistake particularly when there are evil influences at work either within or without the subject if the operator is a sympathetic careful and qualified expert mesmerism may prove highly beneficial for evil influences may thereby be removed by counteracting them and infusing into the subject a supply of beneficial animal magnetism which is opposed to that supplied from opposite sources hypnotic influence from other minds andrew jackson davis began his career as a medium by being mesmerized and others could doubtless develop their mediumistic faculties in the same way but one must be extremely careful in such a case to select a thoroughly competent operator one in whom he has complete faith otherwise more harm than good may result if you find that any one is trying to influence you against your will you may overcome this by a counter suggestion given to yourself from within if the person be absent this may be purely imaginary on your part and the operator in question may be entirely ignorant of the effect he is producing in you 
There are thousands of persons in insane asylums all over the world who suffer from the belief that they are being persecuted by others at a distance, and that these others are endeavoring to influence them by hypnotism, etc. As a matter of fact, nothing of the sort is the case, and their condition is purely the result of imaginary belief. Be most careful, therefore, that you fully ascertain and prove to your satisfaction the existence of this foreign influence before you take any steps to offset it or even seriously believe that such influence is being directed towards you. How to Overcome Such Influences When once you have become satisfied that influences of this character are being directed towards you, take immediate steps to protect yourself, such as those outlined in Chapter 23 obsession and insanity if promptly applied this will effectively offset such conditions coming from outside minds if you are in the presence of a person whom you feel to be influencing you it would then be best to take the precautions and steps outlined in the next chapter devoted to personal magnetism this will prevent your passing under the influence of such a person you need never fear that hypnotic sleep, even if induced, will last a great length of time, and that the subject cannot be awakened therefrom. Sleeps of this character always terminate spontaneously, if they are let alone, though it is always best to see that a hypnotic subject is thoroughly awakened before he leaves the care and supervision of the operator. Otherwise, he may go about in a somewhat dazed condition for a time, and may not be altogether responsible for his actions. An important warning. Somnambulism is a variation of hypnotic sleep where the subject spontaneously performs a number of complicated actions and the subconscious muscular activities play a large part. A person who is subject to somnambulistic attacks should never under any circumstances be awakened suddenly. It is a good plan to speak to such a person and suggest to him as to one in hypnotic trance that he returned to bed and this done suggests to him that it is impossible for such a condition to again occur etc somnambulistic attacks of this character may often be cured by hypnotic treatment and properly directed suggestion prevention of hypnotic influence an operator may prevent his subject from being hypnotized by any other person through forceful suggestions to his subject, that he will be enabled to resist suggestions from any other operator, that he will have no effect on him, etc. If you do not wish to be hypnotized at all, you may give similar suggestions to yourself. These self-suggestions are called auto-suggestions. Lightly given and persistently repeated, they will effectively prevent you from being influenced by any other person. End of chapter 30. Recording by John Smith. Chapter 31 of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olenka. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harrowood Carrington. Personal Magnetism. We all know the difference between a positive and a negative personality between an individual who is naturally successful and one who is not. The former seems to attract to himself success, happiness and prosperity. The latter seems to repel it. It's not necessary for a naturally positive person to say anything or to perform any action in order to make us feel this power within him. It seems to radiate silently from him as a form of power. Many times, doubtless, we have all stepped into a room an elevator, etc., and immediately felt the strong personality and presence of an individual of this character, possessing much natural magnetism. They may know nothing of this power, perhaps hardly realize that they possess it, although they do, in many cases to a remarkable degree. Properly developed and utilized, this power helped to make the great names in history. We may, all of us, cultivate and develop this power to a great extent by proper practice and the degree to which we can develop it will make us successful accordingly. 
not only in the material things of this world, but will also enable us to achieve mental and spiritual heights which the ordinary person cannot attain. The inexhaustible supply. We must constantly bear in mind that there is an unlimited supply of cosmic energy and this will develop personal magnetism to the degree to which we can draw upon it. Exercises for doing so have been given in a previous chapter. We must have confidence in ourselves and in our powers. For confidence in self breeds confidence in others and fear weakens both the brain that plans and the hand that executes. We must use suggestion rightly in our conversation with others and without appearing to do so, constantly give such suggestions as are likely to take root in the mind. And this must be hammered in by constant repetition. Finally, we must not waste the magnetism we may possess by nervous habits, such as tapping on the floor or table with the fingers, pacing up and down the room, etc. In short, all unnecessary gestures. If we save our energy in this way, it is the same as if we received more of it, and this we can utilize to good account. The physical factor. Personal magnetism depends upon various factors. First of all, sound physical health is essential. Without it, there is little virility, and upon the presence of this vital stamina, success largely depends. Theodore Roosevelt's dominating personality was due largely to his extraordinary physical energy. Large muscles are not necessarily a sign of this. It is the vital constitution which must be strengthened, and in order to accomplish this, the internal organs must be in a healthy condition. Proper exercises devoted to stimulating their function should be taken for a few minutes daily, and in this connection the student would do well to consult one or two good books on physical culture, giving directions of this character. Bending movement of all kinds are especially helpful. Deep breathing exercises, which tend to expand the lungs, chest and diaphragm, are to be recommended. And if you can stimulate the solar plexus and internal organs by deep breathing exercises, this will go a long way towards rousing the vital currents of the body. The inner physical causes for this will be explained more fully in subsequent chapters. The mental factor. Next, the mind must be trained and cultivated in certain directions and channels. Just here, the student would do well to turn back and reread the directions given in Chapter 7, Self and Soul Culture, where practical advice on success and its attainment is given. The practice of concentration, chapter 24, would prove very helpful here. Relaxation both of body and mind should follow this. The improvement of memory by various methods would greatly add to the strength of the psychic personality, since it is upon memory that the thread of personality depends. Attention upon any given subject should be cultivated, and you should never allow yourself to perform any action automatically which should be conscious. For instance, if you put an object in the drawer of your desk, make a conscious mental note of this at the time, so that you afterward remember where it is placed, and never allow yourself to place the object there without paying particular attention to it. Many people do this, and it is indicative of a weak power of attention and a scattered mind. The degree to which you can overcome this indicates concentration, and hence power. Nothing gives power and strength to the mind so much as continued exercise and concentration. The spiritual factor. Spiritual development will also assist in the cultivation of personal magnetism by drawing to your aid certain spiritual energies which recharge you, that is, charge your body in much the same way that an electric motor is charged by external energy. This power you draw by placing yourself in a certain receptive condition which invites its influx. All negative thoughts tend to erect a wall between yourself and helpful external guidance, and on the other hand, an affirmative and positive attitude will have the effect of attracting or drawing to you this additional power. Thoughts and emotions also have this effect. If you will carefully analyze your own inner sensations while thinking certain thoughts or experiencing certain emotions, you will find that selfish, self-centered impulses tend to contract you mentally and physically. You feel yourself tightening up all over, as it were, and this internal action shuts off all outside aid and influence. On the other hand, if you think thoughts of friendship, love, etc., you will find your beings tend to expand, and it is this feeling which opens the gates of your soul to an influx of higher power. How to influence others. Personal magnetism is practically useful in the affairs of this life. 
If you wish to achieve a certain object, you will far more likely to do so if you have a good magnetic personality than otherwise. The following simple rules, if followed, will probably greatly assist you in the development of personal magnetism. 1. Just before entering into the presence of the person whom you are about to interview, call up that person's image before your mind and assume toward it a positive mental attitude. If you do this, you will carry over and maintain this attitude towards that person when you meet him. If you assume at the outset 60 or 75 percent of the mental dominance or initiative, you, figuratively speaking, only leave the other person 40 or 25 percent of the ground lying between you which he can possibly occupy. Your business is to assume at the outset as large a percentage of the positive relationship as possible and by doing so you force the other person to assume the minor quantity. The use of the eyes too. When in the presence of the person whom you are to interview, look him squarely in the eyes and hold his gaze and attention until you have won your first point. If possible, do not allow his attention or his eyes to wander from you until you have thoroughly ensured his interest and sympathetic cooperation. It is important to catch the eye at the moment you are making a particular point, so as to drive it home, as it were. You cannot stare a person in the eye all the while you are talking to him, and you should look away part of the time, when you are discussing unimportant points or leading up to the climax. Many salesmen utilize this principle in making a sale. They will draw attention to a book or an illustration at which they ask you to look and talk about it for a moment. Then close the book and make a short, quick remark which will draw your attention to his face and eyes spontaneously. At the moment when he has gained your full attention and you are in a condition to receive any statement he will make to you, he will come to the climax of his argument and perhaps ask you to sign a certain paper which you may be prevailed upon to do under the influence of his personality. How to develop the magnetic gaze. The eyes, therefore, play an important part in the cultivation of personal magnetism, and you should cultivate and strengthen them by certain exercises which will certainly develop them. For example, practice gazing steadily at an object for several seconds without allowing the gaze or the attention to wander and without blinking the eyes. At first you will probably be able to do so for only a short time, but this will gradually be extended as you cultivate the power. Next, practice gazing at a fairly bright object and continue this until you can look at it for several minutes at a time without becoming affected. When you look into the eyes of another person, do not look blankly, but will at the same time and throw the whole force of your personality into your gaze feeling that you will influence that person to do as you wish. Naturally, practices of this character can be, and in fact are, utilized by many persons for evil as well as for good purposes. Those who are endeavoring to cultivate the higher side of their nature, however, will fully realize the necessity of utilizing any added powers they may gain for good purposes only. Passes and Suggestions 3. Downward passes, as before explained, are sleep passes, and a few of these will add emphasis to your speech and impress the person to whom you are talking. Do not gesticulate over much, however, as this will detract rather than add to what you have to say. A few passes at the proper moments will prove of great value. 4. Do not speak hurriedly, for if you do you will give the impression that you are in a hurry, and your hearer will unconsciously grow impatient. On the other hand, do not drawl your words, but speak naturally with a clear, forceful enunciation. The more reposeful and calm you appear, the more receptive your listener will be to hear what you have to say. At the same time, you must be businesslike and precise. How to prevent the influence of others. If you wish to offset the influence of someone who is speaking to you and prevent yourself from being influenced by him, you should see to it that you do not allow him to catch your eye at the psychological climax of the conversation, but studiously look away at that time and carefully think over and analyse what he is saying to you without allowing yourself to be swayed by his manner or words. Look at him in the intervals between these climaxes when he will probably be looking away from you. Hold your mind in a positive attitude and never allow yourself to be hurried into anything. The ability to say no and stick to it, when occasion demands, 
has been declared one of the greatest essentials to success by many men who have attained great eminence. As Abraham Lincoln once remarked, be sure you are right and then go ahead. A clear mind and inner mental repose will greatly add to your power in these directions. Helpful application. These exercises in the development of personal magnetism will be found especially helpful to all psychics for the reason that they tend to offset and counterbalance to a great extent the subjective practices of mediumship and hence balance up the personality by accentuating the objective as well as the subjective side of one's inner self. All those who are developing psychic powers and mediumship should, therefore, while leading their daily lives, endeavour to follow the principles herein laid down and develop their own natures along these lines. They will find that it will prove very helpful to them and preserve that just balance we term health. End of chapter 31《Of Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Phelps Gonzalez《Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them》by Harold Carrington Chapter 32 — Prophecy versus Fortune-Telling the subject with which this chapter deals is a very important one for the spiritualist, for the psychic, and above all for the public medium, for the reason that it concerns him in a very practical manner. It would seem as if spiritualism, although an organized religious body, international in scope and influence, had no standing in the eyes of some people, nor that its accredited mediums were entitled to any more consideration than ordinary fortune-tellers. Fortune-telling, so-called, is against the law, and in many cities the authorities are very severe on anything which can in any way be construed as fortune-telling. Truly, one may be pardoned for believing that there is a power back of it which is opposed to so-called modernisms, to the several movements of a spiritual and religious nature that are freshly putting forth real knowledge of our true relations to this life and the life beyond. It is not merely a moral wave not merely ignorance of the difference between true and honest mediumship and fortune-telling, but an effort to retard and crush the truth. From the present standpoint of the court, Jesus, when he told the woman at the well about certain manners in her life, was a fortune-teller. The people marveled over him because of what he could tell and do. To spiritualists he was a medium, but a master, and one so qualified by time and distance as he comes down the centuries to the present age. In the twenty-first chapter of First Corinthians, Paul describes the gifts of the Spirit, or spiritual gifts, and says they are all of the same Spirit. The word Spirit here is used in the sense of a collective noun or a noun of multitude, much as we use the word Congress, and applies to the Spirit world as the source of inspiration and control, the same as with the spiritualist. Mediums and the Law there was much consulting with mediums in those early days of the primitive church. For does not Paul again say, Try the spirits and see if they be of God. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. Opposition stirs up opposition, and puts men and movements on the defensive. Spiritualism realizes this, and is now actively engaged in efforts for the better protection of its mediums. When one strikes a blow at modern spiritualism, he strikes a blow as well at ancient spiritual truth, that truth which fills the pages of our Bible, for which the early martyrs died and upon which the Christian church was built. It comes as the comforter which Jesus said he would send in the latter days. An assistant district attorney once made a ruling that a sandwich constitutes a meal, and so liquor could be bought on Sunday. But no court can rule that a fortune-teller constitutes a spiritualistic medium, and have it stand. The letter killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. At the same time, prophecy is a genuine spiritual or mediumistic gift, and there are thousands of persons who have experienced so-called premonitions or provisions of the future, and have felt compelled to tell others what they have seen for them. Between prophecy and fortune-telling there is, therefore, a very fine line to be drawn, for the one is dependent upon superstition to a great extent, while the other is a genuine psychical faculty which requires our recognition and study. What Prophecy Is 
So far as we can define the distinction between the two, it may be said that prophecy depends upon internal spiritual promptings, or the reception of definite messages relating to the future which are told the medium by external spiritual intelligences. He acts merely as a medium for transmission in the latter case, and simply gives out what he receives. This is the type of spiritual premonition as distinct from clairvoyance of the future, which we have already discussed in chapter 14. In this latter case, the power appears to depend upon internal and spontaneous quickening of spiritual faculties, and seems to be self-originated, as it were. It is very similar to spontaneous premonitions, therefore, and in fact these subjects are so very closely connected that only an expert can define the differences between them. Unless one has had considerable experience and knowledge in this field, he is totally incapable of judging whether a given set of phenomena are the type of genuine prophecy or mere fortune-telling, and he should study the subject thoroughly before he is capable of expressing an opinion upon it. It may be well to consider the meaning of the word prophecy. It is derived from the Greek word prophemai, pro meaning before, and femai to say or tell. There is another word propheteuo of similar import and derivation, and means to prophecy, divine, foretell, predict, presage, to explain or apply prophecies. In Greek classical literature, the word prophet meant a declarer, foreteller, diviner, a harbinger, a forerunner, a priest, teacher, instructor, interpreter, a poet, a bard. All of these definitions carry with them something of the idea of a character whose mission is in some way connected with the aspirations and longings of mankind. A Definition of Prophecy The Standard Dictionary has defined prophecy as follows. 1. To predict or foretell, especially under divine inspiration and guidance. To prefigure, as to prophecy evil. 2. To speak or utter for God. 3. To speak by divine influence, or as a medium of communication between God and man. Specifically, to speak to men for God, declare or interpret the divine will. 4. To predict future events by supernatural influence, real or professed. To foretell the future. Utter predictions, as to prophecy a disaster. 5. Archaic. To interpret scripture, explain religious subjects, preach, exhort. Under the head of synonyms, the Standard Dictionary gives augur, define, foretell, predict, prognosticate. Prophecy differs from predict by assuming a claim to supernatural or divine inspirations. To prognosticate is to predict from observed signs, indications, or conditions. To prophecy in the scriptural sense is to utter religious truths under divine inspiration, not simply always to foretell future events, but to warn, exhort, comfort, etc., by special message or impulse from God. This scriptural definition seems well adapted to the spiritualist sense of the word when we interpret God to mean the infinite spirit of good. The verb prophecy is also used in the New Testament in the sense of revealing something which had happened and was unknown to the person revealing it, except through some so-called supernatural source. As, for instance, after Jesus was pronounced guilty of death by the high priest, some of the ruffians, who have their counterpart in this day, spat in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him with palms of their hands, saying, Prophecy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Matthew chapter 26, verse 65 to 68. Jesus ignored this challenge. Could they have understood or would they have believed in his mission if he had correctly pointed out the man who had assaulted him? Explanation of Fortune Telling It is true, however, that the method of arriving at the knowledge given is, in itself, an indication of the character of the knowledge imparted. Thus, fortune-telling in the hands of charlatans and quacks is often connected with such superstitious practices as reading the future from tea or coffee grounds, from cards, allowing birds to pick out envelopes containing written messages relating to the future, etc. Such practices are certainly to be deprecated by every sincere spiritualist and truth-seeker, though it should be said just here that many psychics who read the cards in this manner depend not so much on the actual fall of the cards as upon the psychic impressions which they receive at the time the sitter's fortune is being told. This is often true also in the case of palmists. There is doubtless some truth to the general doctrine of palmistry, but it can only hold good to a very limited extent. 
when impressions are received the process is somewhat akin to crystal gazing where the mind is concentrated on an external object while it remains passive and open to internal impressions but instead of receiving these in the form of visual pictures they are given in a more general and vague manner why fortune telling is sometimes true on the other hand genuine mediumistic messages are frequently given while the subject is reading the cards examining the sitter's palm etc it will be observed that in these cases there is a certain fundamental reality in the phenomena but it is perverted and unconsciously covered up by the seer who is unaware of the actual source of the information he gives psychic power or mediumship is the basis of the supernormal information given but it is under the guise of fortune-telling a far more direct and satisfactory method would be to come out in a straightforward and direct manner and state that each and such impressions were received relating to the future and this premonitory faculty could doubtless be cultivated by certain practices and be used as the student progressed in his psychic development exercises for development of these faculties will be given later on in this book why mediums cannot help themselves disbelievers in spiritualism often say if your assertions are true why do not the spirits warn and advise you more frequently and why do they not help you financially or otherwise more than they do the answer is simply as before said that you are not a creator but an instrument a knife may be sharp but it could not cut bread without the power behind it a soldier may go to war and fight bravely without knowing the real reasons for the war you are the knife or the soldier you cannot act by yourself or achieve desirable results unless the power be imparted to you from beyond and even then the power is supplied for other purposes and centered upon other things the knife does not cut itself but the bread clairvoyant power does not benefit the clairvoyant directly but some third person and in cases where the student has found it possible to pervert its use and turn it into selfish channels the power has invariably been lost it may also be said that spiritualists may err in the selection of spirit advisers as well in their mediums of intercommunication that is true for we are not endowed with perfect judgment even in selecting in this life our medical or legal advisers or our governmental representatives and officials our business partners or our friends or the person to advise us as to where we can get the best advice in a given manner the spiritualist merely claims the right to act for himself without let or hindrance from those who differ with him in religious views if he makes mistakes which cause him loss or suffering it must be remembered that even jesus with his extraordinary psychic powers made a mistake when he selected judas iscariot as one of the twelve if it be said that this seeming mistake was a part of the divine plan then it may also be said that the spiritualist seeming mistakes may also be part of a divine plan history of prophecy there can be no doubt that prophecy has existed in all ages and has had its own uses as well as its abuses many spiritualists believe that prophecy is invariably connected with spirits and that the explanation depends upon their communication on the other hand many orthodox religious persons believe that prophecy depends entirely upon the influx of the divine spirit and that the ability to predict or foretell comes directly from god this is the manner in which it is regarded by many people and many religious books there are many references to prophecy and to prophets both in the old and the new testament and any one who accepts the teachings of the bible as in any way true and valuable can hardly fail to believe that prophecy is a genuine psychical faculty which has been exercised by men in all ages and is undoubtedly being exercised by them now thus in first corinthians chapter four verse three we read but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort again in the same chapter verse one we read follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts but rather that ye may prophesy and again in the same chapter verses thirty one thirty two and thirty nine we read for ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets wherefore brethren covet to prophecy and forbid not to speak with tongues one more quotation in first corinthians chapter twelve verse four through twelve we read now there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit and there are differences of administrations but the same lord 
and there are diversities of operations. But it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discernings of spirit, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, abiding in every man as he will. Many other references of this character could be given, but it is hardly necessary, for every student knows that every religious book in the world accepts the genuineness of prophecy, and, in fact, all religions are based on the revelations of seers or prophets. How is prophecy possible? Prophecy is a faculty which usually comes unsought and spontaneously. When the future is seen in an isolated picture or event, it is usually called a premonition or prevision, and many examples of this character have been collected and published by the Societies for Psychical Research. It may be asked, How is it possible to see into the future, to lift the veil of futurity, and glance forward as we glance backward in reading history? Certainly, at first sight, such a thing appears not only impossible but absurd. Nevertheless, it is an undoubted fact, and numbers of cases of this character might perhaps be explained more or less rationally, even with our present knowledge. Thus, certain types of premonitions relate to the future of welfare of the body or health of the subject experiencing them. In such cases we might suppose that the subconscious mind, which has a wider range of inner experience and knowledge than the ordinary waking mind, was aware of certain internal changes and happenings of which the conscious mind was totally ignorant. In such cases the explanation would be that this subconscious mind, having acquired this knowledge, would merely impart or externalize it in the form of a vision, voice, or message, or in the form of automatic writing, etc. A second type of premonition might depend upon subconscious inference and deduction, thus being far more accurate and far-seeing than the conscious mind in such matters, particularly when the latter is occupied with everyday practical affairs. Another set of premonitions might be accounted for by assuming that the knowledge given is imparted telepathically, or gained clairvoyantly by the subject's own mind. In these cases the information would be in the minds of other living persons, and would be gained from them and given out before the subject had gained the fact normally. Scientific Explanation of Prophecy A fourth type of premonition might be explained by assuming that discarnate spirits play a large part and communicate the information to the recipient of the message in question. In this case, the discarnate intelligence would have to be in possession of certain facts, or be enabled to see farther than the psychic himself. And there is much evidence that this is in fact the case on numerous occasions. For example, if we see a spider walking across the table, we know that when it reaches the edge it will either stop or fall over, though the spider cannot foresee these facts, and continues to walk quite ignorant of the fate in store of it. Again, use a more forceful example. Supposing a friend of yours is walking down the street, and is coming to a cross street down which a strong wind is blowing. Being in possession of this knowledge, you can predict with more or less certainty that when your friend reaches this cross street that his hat will blow off, and in fact this actually happens. Now you will see in this case your ability to predict this fact, or partly see into the future, was based on your larger knowledge of certain factors playing about his life. It is only logical to suppose, therefore, that spirits who may be, and probably are in possession of greater psychic powers than we, can foresee tendencies and destinies, to a certain extent, towards which human beings are tending. This being so, they are enabled at times to communicate, perhaps telepathically, statements regarding the future which often turn out to be true. This would be a logical explanation of many cases of premonition of this type, and would explain to us, in a perfectly simple manner, why it is that mistakes and errors so often occur in premonitions of this kind. It would only be what we should expect. It must be admitted, however, that there are many cases of premonitions which cannot be explained in this simple way, and which we cannot in any manner account for, in the present state of science and of our limited knowledge of psychic phenomena. These cases we must simply record and hope that the time may come some day, 
when we will be enabled to comprehend clearly the underlying causal explanation, which will make clear to us the real mechanisms by means of which premonitions and prophecies are fulfilled. End of chapter 32「Chapter thirty three of your psychic powers and how to develop them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harroward Carrington. Chapter thirty three Reincarnation and Eastern Philosophy most religious philosophies of the east are based on the reality of reincarnation or the embodiment of the same soul in a variety of physical bodies living on this earth at various stages of the world's history often separated from each other by a number of years the doctrine contends that the same individuality is maintained throughout all these lives as a background but that each life is also an individual experience which is destined to teach the soul one or more particular lessons which it needed to learn for the purposes of its ultimate progression and perfection the doctrine is based largely upon the law of compensation which says that inasmuch as there is in this life so much obvious inequality as regards the material returns rewards and happiness there must be another chance for that soul at another time and under other circumstances and that the poverty and other conditions which may be present in this life are for a purpose and teach a lesson and that quite possibly in some past life the same individual has been extraordinarily wealthy and has misused the riches and power entrusted to him the memory of past lives this is a fascinating doctrine and one which at first sight asks us to yield our consent to it yet there are many objections to this theory of reincarnation as we shall see presently it may be well to answer here one main objection to the doctrine which is sure to be advanced by the ordinary critic and this is that if the same soul be reincarnated a number of times it should remember its past lives while as a matter of fact it rarely does so and if we are to profit or benefit by these in any way one would think that this memory would be absolutely essential the theosophist or reincarnationist replies to this however by stating that each life is intended to be an individual separate existence without a memory bond or connection with any previous life the soul of the individual which reincarnates only reaps the knowledge of each life after death when this knowledge is added to the total mass of experiences already gained thus the individual human life is conceived to be greater than any single life just as a bucket of water is composed of thousands of drops each drop being separate until merged with others into the whole in the same way each individual life representing a separate drop would be individualized until after death when it is again merged into the total personality our inability to remember former lives is accounted for by assuming that there is no direct connection between the total self and the self which is built up in this life through the physical brain they are separated though it would take too long to explain here exactly the nature and causes of this separation according to the doctrines advanced the arguments for reincarnation another argument which is advanced in favor of the doctrine of reincarnation and to many minds a very strong one is that life must necessarily be eternal and immortal inasmuch as it is indestructible by death and continues to exist to all eternity in the future and for the same reason it must also have existed from eternity in the past and it is inconceivable that such a thing as an individual human spirit should continue to exist for ever after the moment of birth while it did not exist at all previous to that event these are the main arguments which are brought forward in favor of the doctrine of reincarnation and we may add to these one argument based upon experimental evidence it is this 
that many of those who have progressed sufficiently in their psychic development can so they say remember their past lives either fractions of them or incidents in them or the whole life may be remembered as a consecutive series of scenes and events many of the leaders of theosophy and other religious systems of this character contend that they can actually do so the majority of spiritualists however are opposed to this view and contend that reincarnation is not a fact though it must be admitted that in the past there has been a great diversity of opinion on this subject the french school of spiritists formerly headed by allan kardec contends that reincarnation is a fact and kardec's work the spirits book is based entirely upon teachings of spirits who claim that reincarnation is true on the other hand the majority of german english and american mediums contend that reincarnation is not true and spirits who return through them also assert emphatically that it is not a fact the reason of this apparent contradiction was explained in an earlier chapter the communicators merely stated their own views and opinions reasons for doubting reincarnation now in considering this doctrine of reincarnation there are certain factors which we must bear in mind one the average scientific inquirer begins by doubting the reality of survival at all and contends that nothing persists after the change called death for him it is annihilation the first point to be proved therefore is that anything at all exists after death and the phenomena of spiritualism are the only ones which prove this as before pointed out until it is thoroughly established that spirit of any character continues to exist after death it is useless to argue whether or not such a spirit is reincarnated for the reason that the average skeptic would contend that there is no such thing as a spirit to reincarnate until this primary fact of spirit existence is proved therefore it is useless to argue concerning this question of reincarnation Two assuming that this is granted still there is no proof that reincarnation is a fact if we demand proof in the scientific sense of the world in order to establish such a doctrine as this a tremendous mass of testimony would be necessary far more than the ordinary phenomena of spiritualism which claim to establish a comparatively simple truth yet as a matter of fact there is far less evidence as we all know for the reality of reincarnation than there is for spirit return as the strength of the evidence should be proportioned to the strangeness of the facts it will be seen that we are as yet very far from proving reincarnation according to this standard a vast mass of well-attested evidence would have to be forthcoming and this has not been produced Three it is not necessarily true that because the human spirit continues to exist for all eternity in the future it must necessarily have existed from all eternity in the past physics teaches us that a body set in motion comes to rest because of the hindrance or friction from outside forces acting upon it if there be no friction to retard such a body it would theoretically go on forever in a straight line once give a ball an initial push and provided there is no friction it would roll on forever without coming to a stop it might well be therefore that the human spirit once initiated would continue in the same fashion since we can see no hindrances to its progress resembling those acting in our physical world again a speck of mud thrown off from a revolving wheel only exists as an individual speck after it was thrown off in this manner before it was a part of the general mass assuming therefore that an individual human spirit is in some way separated and individualized at birth from the general stock of cosmic life energy at the moment of conception it might be that it continued as an individual thing thereafter for all eternity without necessarily having existed as such in the past the spiral or vortex of life in the next place assuming that life is an individualized force we can quite conceive that this force ascending in a series of spirals tends to become more detached and individualized with each revolution through which it passes 
and that ultimately it will tend to become detached and thrown off as it were from the vortex of life as an individual being birth might represent this process and again we see that it is not necessary to suppose that human spirit must have existed in the past because it continues to exist in the future as to the law of compensation already mentioned this is not really an argument but rather an emotional belief based upon the idea of justice but in the first place this may not necessarily be true and in the second even supposing that it is the same result is reached in other religions for according to the teachings of orthodox christianity the reward of the poor but righteous is in heaven and according to spiritualistic philosophy it depends on individual progress and effort how we remember past lives the doctrine of reincarnation cannot therefore be said to present a logical justification for the belief there remains the more substantial foundation based upon the before mentioned experimental proof namely that many persons claim that they can remember portions of their past lives and even that they can remember the whole of them these latter cases however are very rare and the material from which one could form one's judgment regarding such cases has never been published owing to the lack of respectable evidence in this direction therefore we may assume for the present and until proof to the contrary be forthcoming that such cases depend not upon reality but upon elaborate subconscious imaginations and romances which these individuals have constructed within themselves as the result of brooding and thinking over possible past lives of their own there are many analogies for this belief and in some cases at least it has been proved beyond all question of doubt that these past lives were in reality fictitious and that the memory of them so called was certainly and purely subconscious imagination those who may be interested in obtaining this proof are referred to professor flournoy's book from india to the planet mars where and how these memories originate there remains those cases far less satisfactory and convincing but far more numerous in which isolated incidents of past lives have been remembered or in which scenes have flashed up before the mind together with the impression amounting to a certainty that the individual has experienced or lived through that scene before most cases of this character may be explained in a perfectly natural manner and do not afford any direct proof of the doctrine of reincarnation let me explain a few of the causes which may be operating inducing such apparent memories of past lives in the first place many of them are due to so-called illusions or hallucinations of memory so-called pseudo presentiments in which the event and the feeling that it has transpired become reversed or transposed in the mind so that one remembers the impression as occurring before the real event while in reality it happened afterward that this occurs in many cases has been scientifically proved in the second place dreams or subconsciously noted impressions which never come into consciousness may suddenly flash up in connection with a certain mental event and this would give rise to a feeling true in a sense that we had experienced it before we had but in a dream and not in a previous life thirdly many experiences conversations etc overseen or overheard before the age of four when the personality is in the process of formation and when consecutive memory and consciousness of self is said to begin may be remembered as isolated experiences and these may also give rise to the impression that we had seen them or experienced them before again this is a fact but it was not in a previous life lastly there are many cases in which the subconscious mind noted a scene or event a fraction of second or perhaps several seconds or even minutes before the conscious mind did and when the latter became aware of it there would again be this sense of familiarity and the feeling that we had seen or experienced this event before this is true but it was only a short time before the actual experience for all these reasons therefore and others which it would take too long to give 
the majority of spiritualists and psychical researchers do not at present regard the doctrine of reincarnation as true or in any way adequately proved and prefer to believe until this proof be forthcoming that the individual human spirit is initiated at birth builds up its own life by its own efforts and experiences and that it continues to improve upon this life by continuous striving after it has reached the spiritual world in the same manner that it does here on earth end of chapter thirty three reincarnation and eastern philosophy recording by pamela krantz chapter thirty four of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by cynthia sheeler your psychic powers and how to develop them by herward carrington chapter 34 the ethics of spiritualism as explained at the beginning of this book of instruction spiritualism is not only a scientific question but it is also a philosophical and a religious question it is approachable from the point of view of phenomena also that of theology and ethics the student who has followed the work thus far has doubtless progressed to some extent in the understanding if not in the control of psychic phenomena and fields of knowledge have been opened up before him of which he had previously been more or less unaware but all this would not only be unavailing but harmful if spiritualism were not ethically and spiritually right as well as phenomenally true it is no good developing something which leads one ultimately only into a mire of harmful results and a false philosophy if spiritualism cannot be justified from the religious and ethical standpoint it should be let entirely alone by all save the few scrupulously scientific investigators who approach the subject from that point of view and not as a belief it is very important therefore for the spiritualist to have his belief founded in correct ethical principles for as i have before pointed out the reproach has been raised against spiritualists that they are everything but spiritual unfortunately there are many of this type but they are doubtless in the minority and the majority of spiritualists wish to see their faiths grounded on firm ethical principles is it right to investigate psychic phenomena various questions arise in this connection the objection to spiritualism may first of all be raised that such things are god's secrets which he keeps to himself what is the use of seeking you will find nothing but to this monsignor camille flammarion replies rightly there always have been people who liked ignorance better than knowledge by this kind of reasoning had man acted upon it nothing would ever have been known of this world it is the mode of reasoning adopted by those who do not care to think for themselves and who confide to directors so-called the charge of controlling their consciences if these phenomena really exist they must be part of the universe and subject to natural law for otherwise they could not exist at all there is no such thing as the supernatural all is natural even if it be the communication of spirits it may be unusual or uncommon 
And because of this, we call these phenomena supernormal. That is beyond the ordinary normal experience of mankind, but they are not and cannot be supernatural. Concerning fraud and error. Again, the objection may be raised that these phenomena foster superstition, that this is based upon the belief that the phenomena are necessarily untrue. Once the reality of the facts is established, there is no superstition connected with it. It becomes merely a question of scientific evidence. Again, the objection has been raised against spiritualism on the ground that it encourages fraud and charlatanism. To some extent, this is true, but other cults have suffered in the same way, and all sincere spiritualists are the first to expose falsity and fraud when they meet it. There are spiritualists, it is true, who endeavor to shelter fraudulent mediums and pretend that this fraud does not exist. Such a method is a great mistake and only tends to degrade and lower spiritualism as a religious belief in the eyes of the public. Truth is mighty and shall prevail, and truth should above all else be the watchword of the true spiritualist. Is it healthy and normal? Then there is the objection that spiritualistic practices encourage morbid and abnormal states and conditions and help to induce insanity. Again, there is some excuse for this argument, but as so often pointed out, it is the conscious or unconscious abuse of psychic and mediumistic power rather than its use, which is so dangerous and detrimental. In the initial experimental stages of spiritualism, some harm has doubtless resulted to some experimenters, but this is only a stronger reason for urging us to discover and rightly understand the laws and conditions under which psychic phenomena and spirit communication may operate. When these are once understood, they are thereby rendered safe, and thenceforward there is no reason why spiritualistic practices should be unsafe, save for those who neglect its well-ascertained laws. Again, it has been urged that it is wrong to communicate with spirits of the departed for the reason that such communication is not natural, and that by doing so we interfere with the progression and spiritual development of those who have passed over. But the reply to this is twofold. In the first place, the many cases of spirit return which are recorded prove that these phenomena are far more common than is usually supposed, and for this reason it is not so exceptional a thing, but almost a common occurrence. It partakes more of the nature of natural law than of the experimental or miraculous event. If such is the case, it can hardly be detrimental or unnatural, since none of nature's laws are unnatural. Does spirit communication retard progression? Again, there is no reason to suppose that communication retards the spiritual progress of those who have died. On the contrary, we might suppose that in many cases, at least, such communication would certainly help the spirits. And in many cases, as we know, they have repeatedly come back for the express purpose of asking the living to carry out some mission for them which weighed upon their minds, and they have stated that they could get no rest or comfort until this mission has been fulfilled. There are many cases, again, as we know, 
wherein the returning spirits have requested help and the prayers of the living to assist them in their progress, and many spiritualists have devoted their lives to this work, namely assisting earthbound spirits and helping them in their natural spiritual progress. Many spirits have returned to impart certain information or to give counsel, warning, or advice to friends and relatives of theirs still living. And we cannot but believe that they are far happier in doing so than if they were obliged to stand by and see some unhappiness, accident, or catastrophe overtake their loved ones on earth, while they themselves were obliged to remain inactive. Were they still alive, they would like to feel that they had prevented such a catastrophe, and it is only natural to suppose that they continue to live in this way and continue to take an interest in their loved ones after they have passed over. In this way, spiritual communication becomes a natural and beautiful belief. Should the dead know our sorrows? This brings us to another important question from the ethical point of view. And this is that the so-called dead are in constant sympathetic communication with those still living, and that they, after they have died, have a knowledge of our lives, our trials, and our tribulations. Many religious persons contend that this is a very unethical belief and that they should know nothing of those on this earth after once they have died. Yet, this is surely contrary to all human sympathy and experience. A mother wrapped up in the interests of her child would surely prefer to remain near it and watch over, guard and guide it, if possible, for a few years, rather than to desert it wholly and be totally ignorant of its life and progress. Yet, this is what Orthodox religion contends they should do. Spiritualism is far more ethical in this respect than the ordinary religious teachings, since it tells us that constant sympathetic rapport exists between this world and the next and that there is no abrupt severing of the ties of human sympathy and love at the moment of death. This surely is a comforting thought for the bereaved. The Ethical Teachings of Spiritualism The religious teachings of spiritualism are otherwise far more ethical than those of any other religion. Instead of a world devoted to selfish personal progression, Subject to the changeable whims of an external deity, we have in the teachings of spiritualism a perfectly consistent and scientifically founded religious faith, quite in accordance with the doctrine of evolution. All progress depends upon personal development. As Dr. Alfred Russell Wallace says in his Miracles, of modern spiritualism. The hypothesis of spiritualism not only accounts for all the facts and is the only one that does so, but it is further remarkable as being associated with a theory of a future state of existence, which is the only one yet given to the world that can at all commend itself to the modern philosophical mind. The main doctrines of this religion are that after death, man's spirit survives in an ethereal body, gifted with new powers, but mentally and morally the same individual as when clothed in flesh. That he commences from that moment a course of apparently endless progression which is rapid just in proportion as his mental and moral faculties were active while on earth. That his comparative happiness or misery will depend entirely on himself 
and that just in proportion as his higher human faculties have taken part in all his pleasures here, will he find himself contented and happy in a state of existence in which they will have the same exercise, while he who has depended more on the body than on the mind for his pleasures will, when that body is no more, feel a grievous want and must slowly and painfully develop his intellectual and moral nature till its exercise shall become easy and pleasurable. Neither punishments nor rewards are meted out by an external power, but each one's condition is the natural and inevitable sequence of his condition here. He starts again from the level of moral and intellectual development to which he has raised himself while on earth. Should mediums accept money? One other point remains to be considered. It is this, that mediums accept money for their services, and inasmuch as this is a spiritual gift, it is wrong. Yet, this is common to all other religions. Do not ministers of all other religions receive compensation in some form or other for their services? As long as mediums are living in this material world, they are obliged to meet the costs of living like all other human beings, no matter how spiritual their work or they themselves may be. If mediums possess genuine power, it is only natural, in a sense, that they should utilize it and turn it to account, and it is certainly true that by doing so, they help their fellow men and help those who come to them as much or more than men in any other walk in life. This being so, it can hardly be said that any aspect of spiritualism is in itself unethical. It is, on the contrary, the most sensible, rational, and ethical religion in the world. End of chapter 34. Recorded by Cynthia Sheeler. Website, CynthiaSheeler.ICanVoice.com of your psychic powers and how to develop them. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Krantz. Your Psychic Powers and How to Develop Them by Harrowood Carrington. Chapter 35. What Happens After Death. Precisely what happens at the moment of death is one of the most dramatically interesting and one of the most striking, insoluble problems in the world today. It remains for us the problem of all problems, the mystery of the universe, the science of being. One moment we see a figure before us, a muscular, powerful man, capable of heroic efforts, great intellectual flights, lofty aspirations, delivering an oration which stirs the hearts of thousands, and perhaps helps to sway the destiny of nations, and change the map of the world. The next moment he is lying on the floor, a corpse, lifeless, inanimate, incapable of the slightest thought, the slightest muscular exertion. He is the victim of heart failure. THE MYSTERY OF DEATH a second and all has changed. Nothing can now be influenced by him. Nothing is now possible but the gradual decomposition of the body and its return to the dust from whence it sprang. Could any change be more profound or more lasting, since it can occur, presumably but once in all eternity? The slightest anatomical variation in the man's body, so small, perhaps, that even a microscope cannot detect it, and we then behold the most mighty change which occurs in nature, the profoundest of tragedies and wonders. We behold the transition from the living to the lifeless. We pass from life to death. What is this change we have seen before us? Can we in any way understand it? 
what can we learn what see these are questions over which men have pondered for centuries and which still form the most fascinating problem in the realm of spiritual inquiry why we should not fear death many persons fear death but they should not do so for the reason that on any theory it is not a thing to be feared it has been proved abundantly that with the exception of very rare cases there is no pain at the moment of death and no consciousness of dying both are obliterated by the kind hand of nature the suffering which goes before belongs rather to life than to death and in fact many of those who have suffered from some torturing disease have died with a smile of happiness and contentment on their faces of the physical body we need think little since the spiritual body separates itself from this body after death and thenceforward is as unconscious of it as we are of a finger or any part of our body which has been cut off during life the human spirit takes some time to become severed completely from the physical body and for this reason it should not be buried or cremated too soon after death but with these exceptions we need think little of the state of the physical body since we sever our connections with it entirely as soon as we pass into the spirit world what happens after we have effected this separation is naturally a question of absorbing interest to many minds since all of us have to look forward to this experience the statements of clairvoyance and of those spirits who have returned to tell us of their passage into the next life should therefore be of considerable interest in this connection let us see what they have to say a clairvoyant description of death andrew jackson davis one of the founders of modern spiritualism and a gifted seer describes the process as follows suppose the person is now dying it is to be a rapid death the feet first grow cold the clairvoyant sees right over the head what may be called a magnetic halo an etheric emanation in appearance golden and throbbing as though conscious the body is now cold up to the knees and elbows and the emanation has ascended higher in the air the legs are cold to the hips and the arms to the shoulders and the emanation though it has not risen higher in the room is more expanded the death coldness steals over the breast and around on one side and the emanation has attained a higher position nearer the ceiling the person has ceased to breathe the pulse is feeble and the emanation is elongated and fashioned in the outline of the human form beneath it is connected with the brain the head of the person is internally throbbing a slow deep throb not painful but like the beat of the sea hence the thinking faculties are rational while nearly every part of the person is dead owing to the brain's momentum i have seen a dying person even at the last feeble pulse beat rise impulsively in bed to converse with a friend but the next instant he was gone his brain being the last to yield up the life principle formation of the spiritual body the golden emanation which extends up midway to the ceiling is connected with the brain by a very fine life thread now the body of the emanation ascends then appears something white and shining like a human head next in a very few moments a faint outline of the face divine then the fair neck and shoulders then in rapid succession come all parts of the new body down to the feet a bright shining image a little smaller than its physical body but a perfect prototype or reproduction in all except its disfigurements the fine life thread continues attached to the old brain the next thing is the withdrawal of the electric principle when this thread snaps the spiritual body is free and prepared to accompany its guardians to the summer land yes there is a spiritual body it is sown in dishonor and raised in brightness how it feels to pass over here again what a returning spirit says who has passed through the valley of the shadow of death and has apparently returned to tell us his experiences 
when i awoke in the spirit life and perceived that i had hands and feet and all that belongs to the human body i cannot express to you in the form of words the feelings which at that moment seemed to take possession of my soul i realized that i had this body a spiritual body imagine if you can what the surprise of a spirit must be to find after the struggle of death that he is a new-born spirit free from the decaying tabernacle of flesh that he leaves behind him i gazed on weeping friends with a saddened heart mingled with joy knowing as i did that i could be with them and behold them daily though unseen and unknown and as i gazed upon the lifeless tenement of clay and could behold the beauty of its mechanism i felt impelled to seek the author of so much beauty and youth and prostrate myself at his feet i felt a light touch on my shoulder and joy unspeakable i beheld the loved ones of earth some of whom had long since departed from the earth plane and i felt myself ascending or rather floating onward and upward through the radiance of space i saw about me many spirits and their guides bearing them company through the bright realms of immensity novel experiences on the other side so the human spirit issuing from the body gradually rises higher and higher and comes into touch and harmony with those about it and with those who possess sympathy and mutual interest as explained in the chapter devoted to the spirit world it is highly improbable that there are any physical barriers between the spheres one from another but they are doubtless separated nevertheless by walls of mental and spiritual origin if we are in one of these planes we must progress upward before we can reach or remain with those whom we desire most and for this reason there is a hell so to say for those who cannot attain what they desire which can only be by continual striving upward and onward in this however they are constantly helped and assisted by spirit guides and helpers so that progress is rapid when it is really desired and worked for how we turn back to communicate on the lower planes of existence communication with those of the earth is it is said comparatively easy but this becomes increasingly difficult as we ascend in the upward scale it has often been pointed out that descending to communicate with those on earth is something like going down to the bottom of a muddy pool and those who desire to go to the bottom of muddy pools are very rare even on this earth still spirits moved by ties of love for those left behind make the attempt from time to time successful or unsuccessful in proportion to favorable or unfavorable conditions this however we discussed in former chapters as we progress we are said to acquire more interest in the new world and lose interest in this just as we gradually lose interest in one country when we move into another new scenes new interests and the new environment gradually alter our line of thought but just as we are always glad to see a relative or an old friend from the home town or the motherland so are we most happy to meet and greet those who pass over when their turn comes to join us in the spirit world how we progress in the spirit world after these initial stages have passed upward progress and development begin for many however the shock of death has a very severe effect especially in cases of suicide and those who have met with sudden and violent deaths in such cases these spirits require some time to recover their normal selves and have to be nursed back to health as it were on the other side the same is true of those spirits who have had their minds affected by some mental or physical disease but after this stage has been passed they all emerge into the brightness beyond and begin their interest their instruction their learning and their progress of soul and spirit as well as of intellect which is to occupy them for ages of time to come those who die are received and cared for by loving friends on the other side just as they were when they were born into this world one need have no hesitation nor fear on this account physical birth is a terrible experience but we remember nothing of it and there are always those present who will tender and care for us 
in the same way birth into the spirit world through the gates of death is in many ways a terrible shock yet we are cared for by loving guardians and received with love and care finding happiness awaiting us when we pass from this world into the world beyond end of chapter thirty five what happens after death recording by pamela Krantz. six of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by chuck williamson your psychic powers and how to develop them by harroward carrington chapter thirty six bad and perverted uses of spiritualism every gift or power can be abused many in the past have turned their increased psychic powers into evil channels at various times in the world's history and who continue to do so today they are known as magicians witches vampires possessors of the evil eye etc etc for the moment it may be pointed out that psychic unfoldment and increase of psychic power brings with it added responsibility as our power in this direction is increased so also we are expected to use it rightly if much has been given us much is expected it is quite possible it is true for these powers to be turned to bad account and others injured wealth acquired etc temporarily by their use but if these powers are used for these purposes they are usually soon lost and then the student is in a far worse condition than before for the reason that he is not only without the added power which he craves but also has deteriorated mentally morally and physically as the result of their harmful use the difference between magic and mediumship in the middle ages psychic powers were undoubtedly used for good and bad purposes white magic was beneficial and black magic harmful white magic invoked angels black magic invoked devils in neither case were the spirits of departed human beings called upon but rather intelligences either lower or higher than man in the human scale of evolution another thing which distinguishes mediumship from magic is that mediumship is more in the nature of a request a calling upon human intelligences for help and advice magic on the other hand depends upon invocation or demanding the presence and assistance of other intelligences differing from the human and their assistance in the work to be performed how invocations are performed for the purposes of this invocation various magical practices were undertaken such as prayer the saying of certain words and sentences preparation of the magic circle with its pentagram seal of solomon etc as well as utilizing various magical preparations secured from dead bodies and the poisons of animals and reptiles etc these magical practices were usually undertaken at certain seasons and phases of the moon after long training on the part of the magician and in specially prepared rooms or localities which had been kept apart only for magical purposes exact descriptions of such invocations and the methods employed are to be found in certain rare books on the ritual of magic 
but inasmuch as they are neither healthy nor desirable we do not deem it wise or right to place these teachings before the student who might be tempted did he possess the knowledge to put them into operation and thus injure himself mentally and morally perhaps beyond repair students who are interested may consult a e waite the book of black magic and of pax levi the doctrine and ritual of transcendental magic etc an explanation of witchcraft during the middle ages also witchcraft flourished it depended upon the use of certain psychic powers which witches were said to possess only in their cases this power came directly from the devil himself being bestowed upon them in person by his satanic majesty the witches were all said to meet two or three times a year on some lonely mountain top at midnight these meetings being called sabbaths at these sabbaths all sorts of magical and anti-religious ceremonies were held the sacrament was mocked the devil was worshipped etc the witch was said to swear allegiance to the devil who thereupon touched her on some part of the body which became anaesthetic lacking all sensation these marks occurred in various parts of the body and such marks were consequently known as witch marks the probable explanation of such cases is that in connection with the abnormal mental and physical states induced by witches there resulted in a peculiar form of hysteria in which small zones or patches on the body became anaesthetic modern science now recognizes the existence of such insensible patches and calls them anaesthetic zones they are typical of this form of hysteria this is the modern scientific explanation of the so-called witch marks the journeys to the sabbaths were doubtless for the most part imaginary flights resulting from the administration of opiates and other drugs which they were known to take and with which they anointed their bodies at the same time it is probable that there were many genuine supernormal psychical phenomena connected with witchcraft and this is becoming more and more probable as we progress in the understanding of such cases devil worship another form of perverted occultism is that of devil worship which exists in various forms even today in paris the malay peninsula in london in new york and doubtless in other large cities at these meetings which are devoted to devil worship various invocations etc are gone through and the devil is said to appear in person and bestow power upon certain privileged members of the club who are thereafter enabled to use certain powers to their own advantage many of the scenes of these devil-worshipping societies are too revolting to be described but have been pictured at length on one or two occasions by those who have taken part in these invocations the evil eye again certain individuals have a power which is known as the evil eye this is particularly believed in by the peasants of naples and southern italy by the peasantry of southern spain austria and other countries anyone possessing the evil eye is supposed to have the power of bewitching or maiming any person or animal upon whom he throws his glance cattle looked at by one possessing the evil eye invariably become sick and die 
crops fail pestilence falls etc the evil eye is a gift which is usually unsought but comes spontaneously and is not desired by any one the sure way to guard against the evil eye according to the beliefs of the countries mentioned is to extend the first and fourth fingers of the hand toward the possessors of the evil eye the second and third fingers being folded over into the palm of the hand and kept there by the thumb in this position the outer fingers somewhat resemble the horns of a bull and if the hand holding the fingers in this position be pointed at any of the children or beggars in the above-named countries they will usually turn and fly from the sign-maker many europeans use this knowledge to rid themselves of uh, pestilent beggars vampires and how they attack another form of evil influence which is said to exist and is particularly believed in by the natives of silesia moravia and southern carpathia is that covered by the general word vampire in our ordinary language a vampire is a species of bat and the word is employed because human vampires were said to assume the shape of large bats at times flying in the windows when their victims are asleep a vampire is one who sucks the life-blood of his victims through two small holes punctured in the skin in very much the same way that a mosquito sucks our blood after puncturing the epidermis these holes are said to occur usually in the throat and the victim is of course attacked as a rule during sleep those who are vampires after they are dead and buried are enabled in some miraculous way it is said to leave their coffins and tombs and wander about seeking victims when they are dug up they are found fresh with a pink complexion and the whole body engorged with blood the only sure way to kill vampires it is said is to drive a stake through the heart or cut off the head when a quantity of fresh blood will gush forth and the vampire is killed forever tradition also says that those who are bitten by vampires become vampires in turn modern vampirage vampires of a certain sort however are not unknown in our own day in an interesting article on vampires in the occult review june nineteen o eight dr franz hartmann described a method of what might be termed natural vampirage he refers to the bible first kings one and also alludes to certain processes by which one person is enabled to draw vital energy from another by establishing close contact this process of nature is governed by well-fixed laws through ignorance of these laws many people have become victims of modern vampirage another form of perverted occultism which remains is the employment of charms amulets talismans etc which are often sold for the purpose of inducing mental and physical disease and black magic which has existed through all ages we must not forget also the so-called voodoo practices of the natives of west africa which are said to be remarkable by those who have witnessed them how to protect yourself from occult and evil influences it is often a little difficult for the modern student of the occult to determine just how much he is to believe in these stories 
undoubtedly most of them are based on superstition fanaticism and imagination at the same time there is enough truth in them to make us be cautious and put us on our guard never under any circumstances should you undertake to practice any of them for low selfish purposes in order to protect yourself from influences of this sort if you feel that they are being wielded against you resort to the measures outlined in previous chapters and you may be sure that if you do this you will be impervious to all ordinary influences of this kind End of chapter 36chapter thirty seven of your psychic powers and how to develop them this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by alex caraz your psychic powers and how to develop them by hereward carrington chapter thirty seven snares and pitfalls to avoid the cautious student of psychics who desires to progress along the right lines scientifically and mathematically must be on his guard against all possible sources of delusion and error which may creep into his development so he may never mistake the false for the true or spurious phenomena for the genuine a few sources of error and some of the mistakes which the psychic student is apt to make will be pointed out in this chapter together with the means and methods of guarding against them first of all do not be too credulous of the phenomena you receive and accept if you have a chill or a nervous twitch do not assume that this is some message or a touch from a spirit hand it may be so but you must receive good proof of the fact before accepting it should you be too credulous and accept all such incidents as genuine phenomena you will soon be led away so far that you will become unbalanced in your point of view the over negative condition in your development do not be too negative hold the mind always centered and conscious as i have said and keep the center of yourself always active it is only safe to abandon this in very advanced studies do not be too negative in your daily life or accept the advice which spirits or mediums give you to the exclusion of all else you should reason in such matters thus an intelligence has offered me certain advice if that person were yet alive and offered me the same advice would i take it you should accept the advice of spirits as you would that of human beings who are merely spirits still in the flesh in other words as so often pointed out before in previous chapters use your own judgment and discrimination on all messages received if the messages are of an erratic nature such as those which ask you to give up your position go on a long journey etc you should be most cautious and only accept such advice after you have fully proved to your own satisfaction that it is wise and beneficial abuse of the sixth sense do not depend upon your sixth sense until you have exhausted the senses you already possess if you refuse to let these work you can hardly suppose that help and assistance will come from outside no seed will not grow in a soil that is not prepared neither will spiritual help be planted in your mental soil if you have not worked to prepare it for the spiritual influx as a rule our own individual spirit is the best guide we must consult this first after that if you seek additional advice and help this may often be obtained from wise and experienced psychics but i cannot too strongly warn the student against accepting the advice of poorly developed mediums either professional or amateur on changing mediums and circles it is not a good thing to change developing mediums if this can be avoided if you have found one medium who can assist you to develop and who is apparently doing so helpfully and rightly stick to him through thick and thin until his advice or help fails you the mixture of magnetism which is introduced with change of developing mediums may be at times very harmful the same thing may be said of circles once a circle of sitters is formed the same group should sit night after night and it is not at all a good practice to allow strangers constantly to intrude into the circle and take the places of others if changes must be made let one at a time assume the place of the absent sitter and let him sit thoroughly familiar with the surroundings and conditions before a second change is made 
You would be wise to mistrust names of important historical persons if they appear in your own speech or writing, or if they are obtained at seances. Our natural vanity may lead us to hope and expect that such personages may be present, but there is evidence that in many cases lying spirits have taken the place of those whose names they gave. In this connection, it may be said that the historical personages are not, as a rule, most desirable. The best help and the greatest teachings have been obtained from simple people who are now on the other side. Sensitivity and Mediumship Do not try from the first to develop as a medium. Try rather to cultivate your own psychic powers and strengthen your own inner nature. After you have developed psychically and spiritually in this way, you'll be far better enabled to receive and transmit genuine mediumistic messages. Better enabled also to interpret them. Better able to withstand the strain of mediumship and run far less danger of obsession and other unpleasant symptoms which badly developed mediums are likely to encounter. Cultivate your psychic self, therefore, and after this has been truly trained, begin to train your mediumistic powers. Be on the lookout for evil and lying spirits who will constantly deceive you if you are not prepared for them and remain too open and receptive. Study your own phenomena and endeavor to disengage genuine psychic and mediumistic manifestations from those due to your own subconscious mind. This is an excellent and very helpful practice which will prove useful to you as you progress. Do not assume that all figures which you see are spirits. They may be thought forms, doubles, etheric bodies, or imaginary creations of your own. Things a Psychic Should Avoid you can only learn to disentangle this wonderful chain and separate the true from the false after months and perhaps years of study, observation, and experiment. Above all, remember that symbolic figures and representations must be interpreted symbolically and should never be accepted as representing the truth as it actually exists. One of the great dangers to the amateur medium, as before explained, is that of extending his symbolic, intuitive impressions beyond the proper point. If he stated only what was given him, he would usually be right. But if he endeavors to interpret them himself, find their explanations, etc., he very often goes wrong. Do not hang on too long, so to say, to the impressions and images you perceive. Let them float before you in space, seeing and analyzing them as they pass. Do not endeavor to hold them to you by the power of your mind. If you do so, they will not only vanish and disappear, but you will be unable to retain the impression you receive, and quite possibly the power of perceiving these images which you now possess will become less and less and gradually leave you. Always remember that psychic phenomena of this character cannot be commanded. They can only be sought and welcomed when they appear. In other words, they are spontaneous and not experimental phenomena. How to distinguish the true from the false if you constantly make use of your own judgment and critical faculty in studying the phenomena which you develop or those which you may observe in others, you will build up within yourself two things. One of these is the power of judging, that is the ability to perceive the true from the false, and which above all else is what you as a psychic desire. It is difficult to explain the difference in words, but as nearly as possible it may be said that these phenomena which are innately true carry with them a sense of conviction, a feeling of warmth and familiarity, and we feel them as part of ourselves. The other phenomena, although occurring in our own minds, will seem to us cold, strange, and extraneous, and when once this power to distinguish between the two types of phenomena has been developed, you have taken one of the most important forward steps that is possible for any psychic to take. Many mediums, indeed, never reach this state. Their mediumship is chaotic. It has never been developed on rational, progressive lines. But if you have done so, you may rest assured that you are not only a genuine and true medium, but you have passed through the early stages and danger zones which so often beset the student in the early stages of development. How to Guard Against Outside Influence The second important step which the student takes after he has once passed this stage is that while he will be sensitive and receptive to telepathic clairvoyant and other forms of perception, and also to spirits both in and out of the body, he will be practically impervious to harmful or malicious thoughts and influences which may be impelled against him not only on this sphere, but by the spirit world as well. If a trance clairvoyant during a state of ecstasy leaves his body and wanders off into space, 
without having previously gained sufficient knowledge and hence control of the situation he is liable to be blown hither and thither figuratively speaking like a soap bubble by the breezes and will be open to impressions from all sources these he may not feel or know at the time but he may carry these back with him into his body and afterwards they may affect him to the detriment of his own mental and spiritual health in other words he has not learned to protect himself while severed from the body as he can while in it this is one of the greatest dangers which the advanced psychic is liable to encounter and at the same time after he has once learned the secret of protecting himself in this manner he may be assured that thenceforward his progress will be most marked and rapid not only in psychic and mediumistic development but in the spirit world after he has entered it permanently at death the value of psychic development to the individual psychic development is therefore of inestimable worth if rightly cultivated for the rapid progression of the individual human spirit just as much as the same power badly employed is harmful to the human spirit both here and hereafter it all depends on the manner in which these forces and powers have been cultivated and are utilized and while too much cannot be said against their improper use a great deal may be said in favor of their proper application and development in the right direction it is my hope that every reader of this book will develop himself along the right lines and that he may receive help advice and encouragement at all stages of his spiritual unfoldment both here and hereafter end of chapter thirty seven recording by alex caraz new york